Hello, my name is John, and this is the Mask Face Journal, and this is what I read this week. Blue Beetle Rebirth, written by Keith Giffen and art by Scott Collins. As with most of the Rebirth books, this is setting up a new status quo for the character, or should I say characters, because this book kinda has two Blue Beetles in it. The main character is Jaime Reyes, the most recent Blue Beetle, with the sentient scarab on the back that provides an armor for its host. Helping him being the Blue Beetle is former Blue Beetle Ted Kord. I say former, but in this continuity he has of course never been the Blue Beetle, despite being the classical version of the character. What we get here is a mix of new and old. We have teenagers Hamey flying around in his suit of armor, constantly fighting its homicidal tendencies, but we also have old staples like the flying beetle ship Bug, piloted by Ted Court. There's a major retcon going on here, but as it is at the end of the issue, it could be considered a spoiler to discuss it. But it's also exactly the same exchange that happens in the pages of Jeff Johns' DC Universe Rebirth, so if you read that, it's not exactly surprising. Me being who I am, I can't help but notice a possible meta parallel with Batman Beyond here. We have the older version of the character advising the current version of the character via Comlink, and the guy who played Terry McGinnis aka Batman on that show also played Hamie Reyes, Blue Beetle, in Batman Brave and the Bold. I'm not sure I'll continue reading this. I've never really been a fan of Blue Beetle, and I'm mostly familiar with him through other media. That being said, this isn't bad by any standards. It just didn't really grab me. I'm sure if you've been a fan of the character before, it's definitely going to interest you. Batgirl number two, written by Hope Larson and art by Raphael Albuquerque. I'm not sure what to think about this. It feels so inconsequential. Most of this issue, Babs is arguing with herself if she should or shouldn't date the guy she's been traveling with, who is also a childhood friend. It's also about her trying to better her fighting abilities, so we get a bit of her going to the gym for training. Aside from something that happens at the very end of the issue, it feels like it doesn't have a direction for the story. Things just happens. We get nowhere when it comes to the mystery we set up in the previous issue where Bab's friend was attacked by a Japanese schoolgirl villain, and the characters in the story aren't even really questioning it. Like I said, I'm not sure where this is going because it doesn't feel like it has any direction. Titans, number two, written by Dan Abnett and art by Brett Booth. This is fun for a Flash fan. This book is continuing to deal with what interests me the most about Rebirth, Wally West. This issue is the beginning of a big fight between the Titans and doppelgangers created to look and act like their younger selves. It also serves as a reintroduction of one of the Flash's greatest foes, Abracadabra, to the DC Universe. It continues to play on the confusion caused by Flashpoint and the whiplash effect of Rebirth. If you consider yourself a post-crisis or just Wally West Flash fan, this is a must pick up, despite having one of my least favorite artists of DC on it right now. The Flash, number 5, written by Joshua Williamson and art by Felipe Botanabe. This is an interesting story told from a different perspective than usual. It's mostly told by Barry's new girlfriend, Mina, that for the last few issues has been in charge of Star Lab's speedster training program. This issue mostly deals with her taking an interest in training Wally West in the ways of the Speed Force. Not the previously mentioned Wally West from the Titans book, but the one that has been a presence in this book since the New 52. I quite like this. It was a nice break from the norm that still furthers both story and character development, and the art is for the most part a lot better than has been on this book for a while. Wonder Woman number 5, written by Greg Rucka and art by Liam Sharp. I am no longer sure of what is going on here. It feels like we've been dropped in the middle of another story than the one we've been reading. Sure, all the characters we've been following are at the same place where we left them, but we get a reveal of an underlying story that we've previously not been aware of, and that feels strange because of a lack of buildup. This issue opens with Etta Candy briefing her boss about the current situation with Steve Trevor and their team, and the fact that they are missing. Her boss is only being referred to as Sasha, which I can only assume, since this is being written by Greg Rucka, means that former Batman sidekick slash bodyguard Sasha Bordeaux has been reintroduced to the DC Universe. This issue talks a little bit about the confusion of the status of Wonder Woman's origins and the status of Themyscira and the Greek gods, but not nearly enough. We need to start actually dealing with what happened and why soon, not just keep stating that things are weird. Detective Comics, number 939, written by James Tinney and the Fourth and art by Eddie Barrows. This is pretty damn good. I like it whenever people are communicating with each other in these stories, and in this, we get some pretty good interactions between our protagonists, especially Batman and Batwoman. 
I kinda like Clayface the best. For a former supervillain, he's very innocent and tragic, yet there's a youthful excitement to him. This deals with the Black Ops organization Colony and their willingness to kill a lot of innocent people to eliminate a sleeper cell of the terrorist organization League of Shadows hiding in Gotham. An organization Batman is convinced doesn't exist and is merely a legend perpetuated by Ra's al Ghul. What's hinted to in this book is the possibility of Batman being wrong and Colony being right. I am excited to keep reading and finding out the answer to that question. Action Comics number 962 written by Dan Jurgens and art by Steven Segovia. Alright, finally we're getting somewhere. Sure, we still have no answers to any of the questions raised in this book and we're not really any closer to any of the theories, but at least it's the end of this first story. It seems like the next thing on the agenda is going to deal with this new Clark Kent mystery. I hesitate to say that this story arc has been a story, because all it has done is raise questions and start plot threads, but not resolving anything. It has been non-stop action with a few character scenes thrown in. What I'm most interested in here is Lex Luthor, and his apparent desire to be a better person. He is still Lex Luthor, still arrogant, still morally questionable, but in this new universe, maybe not beyond redemption. So that was what I read this week. Did you enjoy this video? Please like, comment, subscribe and share this video. Did you not enjoy it or disagree with me? Please let me know in the comments and still share this video. That is everything from me this week.